Right now, Election Day 2020, the moment we've all been waiting for. This does not look like a second place finish. America votes turnout could be the biggest in 100 years. Power to change this country is in your hands. Everything is on the line, the most contentious race yet. We have team coverage. Early voting broke records, leaving many hoping for a smoother election day. I'm Jessica Easthope, getting the pulse of the polls, the problems and the praise here in Brooklyn. Boarded up cities around the country, hoping for the best, expecting the worst, preparing for chaos in the streets. You don't often see Fifth Avenue like this. There's no window shopping here. Bergdorf's is boarded up and some luxury apartments are getting private security. I'm Emily Druby with the preparations in New York City. Plus the Catholic vote, the religious population in small swing state counties could decide the election of the century. Who will win? The showdown starts now. You're looking at a very quiet Barclays Center in Brooklyn. Some last minute voters lining up to make sure their voices are heard. In just a few hours, the polls will close and New Yorkers like the rest of the country will have to wait to see who comes out victorious. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. One of the most divisive election seasons in the nation's history is coming to a close. Voter turnout and voter outrage has been off the charts, with many expecting the aftermath to be just as contentious. We have team coverage, starting with Currents News' Jessica Easthope, who's at the Barclays Center, where people have been voting all day. Jessica. Christine, the record number of early voters might be the main reason for a shockingly smooth day here at Barclays Center. Officials tell us the arena, which is the largest voting location in Brooklyn, has only had about 300 voters so far. Those numbers slow but steady throughout the day. Walk up and come right in. That's what voters were doing Tuesday afternoon at Barclays Center and the Brooklyn Museum, two of the busiest early voting sites. People got it out of the way. Some were shocked by the lack of crowds, but chalked it up to the nearly 100 million people who voted early this election. My grandfather actually, he voted early here and he said there was a very long line. So I'm just, I am a little surprised that on election day there's virtually no line. I'm hoping it's because everyone did it earlier, which I mean the numbers look like that. So I'm always happy to vote and it feels very empowering and important, but I guess we'll just wait and see and pray at the Brooklyn Museum. The black chef movement was stationed out in front with free food, making sure Election Day energy was up. So we're just here to help support people who are in need of some food or some energy in order to, to vote and have their voices heard. And at Barclays Center, Deborah Dawkins was giving back in her own way, handing out flowers in memory of her mother. I'm here with these flowers because my mother, who was, an ad, who was very adamant about voting, is no longer with me. She passed away May 3rd from COVID. Oh, thank you. Well, the pandemic was at the forefront of voters' minds as they headed to the polls. If I wasn't going to vote already, it would be the main reason why I'd be voting now, because um, we've been in quarantine now for over six months. Some places, even back in Europe, they're going back into lockdown. So it's absolutely not over. The pandemic was high on the list of voter issues for people we spoke with today. They said after more than six months of feeling like so many aspects of their lives have been uncertain, voting is their way of taking back control. In Prospect Heights, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. Christine. Jess, it was smooth sailing for many, but what other issues were voters experiencing at the polls today? Yeah, Christine, not everyone was as lucky as the voters who came here today to Barclays Center. Lines were a problem in other parts of the city, as well as some ballot readers not working in several other locations, which is a common problem on Election Day, but is usually resolved pretty quickly. All right, we know more than a million New Yorkers voted early this election season, but for people that waited until today, when is the latest that they can vote? If you weren't one of the people that got to the polls early, don't worry, it's not too late. The polls in New York City close at 9 p.m. Christine. 
Thanks, Jess. Protests that could escalate into violence is a concern that has business owners and law enforcement taking precautions. Currents News' Emily Druby is in Midtown Manhattan, where storefronts are being boarded up ahead of tonight's tally. Emily. Christine, there's a real fear out here that the election results, no matter the outcome, could spark protest in possibly violence. Now, a lot of New Yorkers lived through the looting back in early summer, and they learned their lesson. Luxury buildings have beefed up their security for tonight. And here on Fifth Avenue, this entire stretch of businesses has boarded up their windows and their doors, just really preparing for any possible scenario. In Midtown Manhattan, the normal noise of busy streets filled with commuters and shoppers replaced by the sounds of power tools cutting into wood and being screwed into buildings. This has been the scene across New York City for the past few days. Businesses boarding up their windows for safety while reports of luxury residential buildings hiring extra security, both gearing up as many fear the aftermath of this contentious election could include civil unrest. The intelligence that we're hearing, there's going to be protests uh, no matter who wins. Kenneth Weiss is a senior account manager for Advanced Electronic Solutions, or AES. The security company services some of the biggest residential and commercial buildings in the city. We visited their College Point Queens offices to learn more about how buildings across the city are preparing for this potential election aftermath. Kenneth tells us they're using a combination of electronic security in terms of technology and physical security in terms of bodyguards. Security is like an onion, so you want to have different layers. And the more layers you have, the harder it is for someone to cause damage to persons, property, or um, information. And... Um, let them go to the next building. He says they'll also be using technology to monitor large group gatherings. A lot of the clients are using overt and covert video surveillance and using some smart techniques, artificial intelligence, deep learning algorithms, so that if a crowd is forming, it can alert someone that's monitoring the system and hopefully let them take some action before a problem occurs. Partisan clashes have already happened all over the country. Fears that the same will happen here in New York. Mayor Bill de Blasio shrugging off questions about potential violence during his daily press conference. What we've seen in general is peaceful protest, uh, respecting peaceful protest, people working together peacefully. That is the future. That's what I expect to see from this point on if there is protest. The mayor further asking people to accept the, re the election results. He does have the NYPD on standby just in case. On Fifth Avenue in Midtown Manhattan, Emily Drewby, Currents News. Back to you, Christine. Emily, what's the tone out there on Fifth Avenue? How are residents feeling? It's really a wait and see kind of situation out here. Many people I spoke with say while they're hoping for the best, they are preparing for the worst. New York City is not the only place uh, bracing for potential protest. Uh, the FBI is warning that Portland, Oregon could see armed conflict. Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills is shut down and hundreds of National Guard troops are ready just in case. Christine. Thanks, Emily. The NYPD issuing a warning today as they're out in full force making sure voters are safe. Chief Terrence Monahan saying that New York's cops know who the potential disruptors are. He gave them a clear message. You will be arrested. The NYPD, as always, will facilitate any possible peaceful protest. But my message to anyone who wants to cause violence and destruction is don't even try it. Former NYPD Chief of Department and the former Commissioner of New York City Emergency Management Joe Esposito spoke with us yesterday about the preparations police make for elections and if this year's efforts have been enhanced. The NYPD and other law enforcement across the country, they always prepare. Uh, but again, to what level? And that depends on the intelligence they're getting. And the intelligence we're getting on this, the NYPD's intelligence they're getting on this, is that they got to be extra careful because they're thinking that uh, whoever wins, they think there'll be demonstrations on the, on the, starting on the 3rd and going for at least a few days after. Esposito also said the NYPD has been drilling for weeks in case protests turn violent around the city. 
The White House has built a wall in case of possible protests. The so-called non-scalable fence wraps around the entire perimeter of the building. This is the second time a structure of its kind has been installed to protect 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The first was during mass protests for racial justice over the summer. The Secret Service has not commented on the measure. Some argue this may be the most important election in the history of our nation with a lot on the line, especially for Catholics. Joining us now is St. John's University political science professor Brian Brown. And Brian, both candidates made their final push for votes right up to the wire, hitting all of the battleground states. And today, President Trump working the phones from the White House while Joe Biden made his way back to his hometown of Scranton. Do you think it will make a difference at this point? Well, based on the turnout, yes, there's uh, long lines at the polls, a record-breaking turnout could be unprecedented. So, you know, the candidates are doing the right thing by working right up to the last minute. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Tens of millions hit the polls before today. There were record numbers of early voters this year here in New York City. More than a million cast their ballots early. So how unprecedented is the sheer volume of early voting and how do you think it will affect the outcome? Well, certainly it will have a big effect on the outcome. Uh, we're looking at an unprecedented voter turnout. It'd be interesting to see, are people voting early because of their candidate and the passion for the election? Are they voting early because of COVID-19 and they want to avoid long lines and crowds? Uh, so it'd be really curious to see the exit polls to what's motivating voters, but we could see a record-breaking turnout and that's a good thing for both parties. All right, let's talk a little bit about the congressional races, because these races could actually determine who has the power in Washington. Now, the Republicans have control of the Senate right now, but there are enough seats up for grabs that could change that. So what do you see happening and how can the balance of power be tipped? Well, the Democrats need a net gain of four seats to get control of the Senate. And uh, if Joe Biden wins, then you will have one party in power of all our branches of uh government. And that is uh, will be interesting and certainly give you a mandate for the Biden administration. Uh, here in New York, we have a number of close seats, in particular Staten Island, uh, Brooklyn, uh, New York 11. There's a couple of close races out east uh, in Long Island, as well as in the Central Valley. So a lot of interesting races going on. I think the Democrats will maintain control of the House. The Senate is certainly up for grabs um, and we'll see what happens. But we may not know until January because Georgia is looking like it'll go to a runoff election if uh, no candidate gets a majority. And uh, so we, we might be waiting around a long time to see who is in complete control. Right. Now, there's a lot of talk about the Latino vote in this election. Historically, while this group tends to be more conservative, they vote Democratic. But we are seeing a lot of Latino support for Trump this election year. In fact, there was a big Trump rally in Miami over the weekend. Do you think the Biden campaign did enough to court the Latino vote this year? Well, it'll be interesting to see because the Biden campaign really laid low until about Labor Day. And mm -hmm. then, uh, you know, he really got out on the road. Um, the Trump campaign really emphasized a ground game and they did some micro targeting of the Latino vote. Um, to really drill down into the diverse uh, constituency that they are. Uh, you know, when you see Barack Obama going down to Florida, he's a pretty heavy hitter and a surrogate for the Biden campaign. So that tells me that they're concerned about the turnout, mm -hmm. and we'll have to see. All right, so do you think we'll know who won tonight? Um, I hope so, but <laughs> not for certain, uh, especially if it comes down to Pennsylvania, I think there's seven counties that don't even open up the ballots until tomorrow. Um, so it could be a while, but um, God willing, when the dust settles, we'll have a clear winner and we can all move forward. All right. We'll check back in with you tomorrow. Brian Brown, St. John's University political science professor. Thanks for joining us. Great to be with you. There's a lot more news headed your way. Another terror attack in Europe just days after three were killed in a church in France, this time Vienna the target. We'll have the latest on the suspects and the death toll. Then a battle is brewing over the rights of the faithful as a California church faces huge fines for violating public health orders. And Caritas in the Philippines is stepping in to help hundreds of thousands of people displaced by a killer typhoon. What you can do to help coming up. Now you can help us put your faith in the news. The next time you capture a newsworthy event, send us your pictures or video. It's easy. Go to netny.tv slash send us and you may see your submission on Currents News.
A terror attack in Austria has left four people dead and at least 15 wounded. Witnesses ran from the scene of Monday night's shooting attack, which happened near Vienna's main synagogue. Authorities believe one attacker who was shot dead was radicalized as an Islamic State sympathizer. This happening just days after that church massacre in Nice, which authorities have described as an Islamist terrorist attack. Pope Francis reacting to the violence on Twitter, saying, I express my sorrow and dismay for the terrorist attack in Vienna, and I pray for the victims and their families. Enough violence. Let us together strengthen peace and fraternity. Only love can silence hate. Bishops in Austria also praying for the victims. Vienna Cardinal Christoph Schonborn told an Austrian Catholic news agency, it must be clear that nothing can justify blind violence. And Archbishop Franz Lackner, president of the Austrian Bishops' Conference, said, believers must condemn this act in the name of God and inwardly resist it with all their strength of spirit and faith. The death toll is rising in the Philippines after the most powerful typhoon of the year lashed the country over the weekend. <laughs> Provinces south of the capital city of Manila suffered the brunt of the storm with 20 people dead and counting. Officials estimate that 13,000 homes have been damaged or destroyed and almost 400,000 people displaced. This is the 18th storm to hit the Philippines this year. Caritas Philippines has launched a global appeal to help the victims. The national director writing, The typhoon will surely bring greater poverty to our communities severely affected by the typhoon, as they have also been battling against the effects of COVID-19. For more information on how you can help in the relief efforts, visit Caritas.org. Back on this side of the world, at least 4,000 families are already in shelters as another Category 4 storm, Hurricane Ada, batters the shores of Nicaragua. Winds of up to 145 miles per hour and days of flooding are expected throughout Central America. Ada is the 28th named storm of the season, tying the record set back in 2005. The man who confessed to burning three traditionally black churches in Louisiana has been sentenced to 25 years in prison. Holden Matthews pleaded guilty in February to three counts of church arson and one count of using fire to commit a federal felony. The fires took place over a 10-day period in St. Landry Parish in the spring of 2019. All three places of worship were burned to the ground. Matthews was also ordered to pay more than $2 million in restitution. A battle for religious freedom is raging in California. Calvary Chapel in San Jose was slapped with a $300,000 fine for holding large indoor services despite COVID restrictions. Now a judge has granted Santa Clara County a restraining order against the church, requiring them to further restrict the religious gatherings. Chris Reyes spoke with the church community and some pastors who are calling it cruel and unusual punishment. $330,000 in fines levied against a pastor for simply opening up. Dozens of pastors from all over California stood shoulder to shoulder, no masks and no social distancing to support Pastor Michael McClure of Calvary Chapel in San Jose. The church is facing legal action from Santa Clara County for holding indoor gatherings in violation of public health orders. Their attendance averaged about 700 in a space that can hold 1,900 people. The county limits indoor gatherings to 100 people. The church has now retained its own lawyers to fight the fines and possible jail time for its pastor. Over the past five months, not one person in his congregation has contracted COVID-19. They have contributed zero to the total infection rate in this county. Pastor McClure says there are signs in his church to social distance and people can wear masks if they want, but none of it is enforced. Santa Clara County Council James Williams says that's the reason why the county felt the need to go to court. You know, we've tried to work with them for a long time. Pastor McClure insists there have been no such conversations between his church and the county. And I'd love to work with the health department, but they just came here and got really upset and yelled at us and left. They never wanted to talk to me. They never want to work with me. 
and I'd love to. We're, we're, we're trying to help the community. Santa Clara County's council says 10 notices of violation were given to the church, and with each notice, the county reached out with suggestions on how to safely worship. At the press conference, the group was repeatedly asked why they were not social distancing or wearing masks. Sure, we're outdoors. And if you read the warning label on a medical mask, it will not protect you against COVID. We are not against wearing masks. We're not against not social distancing. Um, but what we're for is freedom. That was Chris Reyes reporting. Another hearing will be held on December 1st to determine if the restrictions in the temporary restraining order will stay in place. Still to come on Currents News, victims who lost everything in the fires that raged in Northern California are getting some memories back with a little help from a local church. And we will share the Novena Prayer, spearheaded by the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, meant to help Catholics form their consciences. Stay with us. A California family lost their home and their memories as their treasured keepsakes went up in flames in the wildfires. But thanks to an area church and photo studio, they're making new memories. Phil Gomez has the story. We were told the next morning within the hour of evacuating it was all gone. Somewhere among the ashes of Tammy Galvin's home on Little Basin Road in Boulder Creek are burned and lost memories. Still grieving the loss of her father-in-law, three months ago her mother passed away. Her sweater and her perfume were in the house. I didn't grab them because I thought we were coming back. It's not only the house that was destroyed in the intense blaze, but precious things that she held close to her heart. A trunk full of pictures of Tammy when she was an infant, as well as those of her children that are irreplaceable. Life is really hard for them right now. You know, COVID and online learning and stuck in this tiny trailer with everybody. And um, so it's, it's for them to, you know, get a little happiness that I can give them whenever I can give it to them. San Francisco Zion Church and Highlight Studios began reaching out to fire victim families, offering free photo shoots. Some of the photo albums that they lost within the fires, we thought that that's not something that they can replace. Um, so the small thing that we can do to give back is at least try to provide a glimpse of hope. 16-year-old Isabella and 9-year-old Caleb posed with their mom for the beginning of a new family photo album. Those are pictures that I can start saving again that I don't have anymore. My youngest daughter that's here, she's a junior in high school. So those are pictures that we'll be able to start up again and have those for the future. Again, that was Phil Gomez reporting that particular wildfire, which was raging for nearly 40 days and burned close to 87,000 acres across San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties, has since been contained. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Remember, there's still time to vote. Polls close at 9 p.m. And in honor of Election Day, we'd like to end this newscast with a prayer. So no matter who wins, God can bless our country and our president for the next four years. Hope to see you again next time. Today, as we approach the polls, may we understand and embrace the principles of our faith that should guide our political engagement. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen.